Hello and welcome to the DIY Investing YouTube channel. We are working through every company in the S&P 500 and today is Duke Realty Corporation, ticker DRE. Over the next few minutes, I'll discuss my thoughts about the valuation of this company and its business quality. We have the market cap at $18 billion, enterprise value of $22 billion. That's about $3.5 billion of net debt. So you have some leverage here on this business. That's pretty common for a real estate investment trust, which this is a REIT. Um, they own and operate about 159 million rentable square feet industrial assets. That's a key piece. 20 major logistics marshes. So um, not a lot of information there other than that it's a REIT and industrial assets. So you have a 0.72 beta. Um, this means it's going to be a relatively low volatility business. Um, one thing that immediately stands out in this return on invested capital is you have two years of losses here. You have 2009 and 2012. They lost a little bit of money, but otherwise you made money in 18 out of 20 years. That's pretty good overall. Um, but what's interesting is you have one off number in 2017, but overall you're generally sitting here about a three, four, five percent return on invested capital. You see this 3.4, you get up to 6% in 2005, 8% in 2015, and 9% in 2021. But for the most part, you're the 3, 5% range. And that's pretty low for return on invested capital. It's not, it's not unheard of with the recent real estate markets, but it's a pretty low return on invested capital, which is going to limit your returns as a shareholder. You see this return on invested capital averaging that 5% return on equity of 8.5%. Now you're getting that 8.5% because it's leveraged up from 5.1%. Um, that's that leverage I talked about here that is helping you some. But again, one of the problems with this is that a return on equity is really the upper end of what you can expect as your return on a shareholder over a long period of time. So this is saying the upper end of our returns is eight and a half percent unless something changes with their future return on invested capital. So that's a little bit low. I like to see this as a double digit because I seek double digit returns with my investment portfolio. So right now I'm thinking this is a relatively lower quality business based upon what I'm seeing here. Now the price to earnings ratio provides an equity yield which is kind of like the lower end of your return here. And here we see that the equity yield is about 5.2%, 5.5%, somewhere in that range. So we're saying, okay, maybe our return on investment is going to be somewhere between 5.5% to 8.5% if you hold over the long term. And that's kind of giving you the range of what you should expect. Now, the downside here is your price to book ratio is three, which means that you're actually your current return on equity is much lower than this. So it's going to be really interesting trying to make that number work out. And what I think is happening is why is this big discrepancy here? These two numbers don't make sense on their own because this is suggesting that the current earnings yield should be something close to 3%, but it's saying it's 5.5%. And I can quickly go down here to the return on investment number. So and what you can see here with the earnings numbers is this big discrepancy between um, the current year 2021 and the last few years of a dollar earnings per share. So what this is probably saying is that your earnings are actually being overstated in the recent years. So your price to earnings ratio shows a little higher than it currently is because you're extrapolating this $2.25 instead of something like a dollar in earnings, which seems to be more applicable. This 2017 number seems off as well because it, it's out of place. You probably have some tax effects or something like that in here. Um, so just something to be aware of that maybe you can't rely on this number um, that that's playing into that. Uh, what that means is that you're actually paying quite a high price for this business when you have a relatively um, low median return. I mean, what I want to be paying with a return on equity of 8.5% is I want to be paying a price to book below 1, something like 0.75, you know, price to book, 0.8. 0.6, something in that range. And then I'd be looking for a price to earnings ratio that's quite high because I want it to be relatively, um, you know, above 10% earnings yield, which means you need to be paying like an eight or nine PE. We're really in a different situation here, especially when you look at revenue growth being negative, um, free cash flow being negative over the course of a decade. That's a really big concern. Um, for me as a sh potential shareholder, I mean, look at these EV numbers here, 33, 62, 21, 35. That's really showing that the company is quite overvalued. Um, and if we're saying, okay, maybe earnings power is a dollar something, then you're paying, you need to buy this at something like a 
price of 10 or less. I mean, that would require like an 80% drop in the price. It doesn't necessarily look likely, um, but it's something that you should be aware of there. So immediately what I'm thinking here is just that this company is going to be really high priced. Um, you need to be paying in that eight or nine dollar range. It's highly unlikely you're going to find that with this company. But if you get an opportunity, that's something to think about. Now, if you're enjoying this video so far, if you're learning something from it, please hit that like button. Don't forget to subscribe. We're working through every company in the S&P 500, providing educational content that I hope you will find helpful as you learn to be a better investor. Now, let's dive on into the income statement to see what else we can find. So sg is not growing a lot, but it is growing some, which is a little bit of concern if you're not growing your net income. Um, you have grown it a lot, though. Something's going on here. Uh, well, part of the problem here is your dilution. So you see this 268, and then you're going to 383. So you've increased your share count by about 50% over the last decade. So despite increasing your operating profit pretty substantially, you've basically doubled your operating profit over the course of a decade. You haven't doubled your net income per share because of this dilution problem. I mean, you have this growing EPS, but you've diluted half of the, the shareholder base with this 50% increase, or I guess a third of the shareholder base with this 50% increase in shares outstanding. So that's going to be a limitation for you. Now, the trailing 12 month of 2021 numbers make this look pretty good, but you can see that they're distorted by this non-operating income. You see the 671 million non-operating income, 772 non-operating income, maybe that's selling some properties. Now they do have non-operating income pretty consistently. Um, so that makes it really hard to tell what's going on in the underlying core business. Um, but that is offsetting the net interest income. So I would be interested in what they're doing. Are they turning around properties, selling properties, doing something along those lines? How dependable is this number? If you can depend on numbers like this, then, th then you can actually extrapolate these EPS numbers. If you can't depend upon it, then something like this eight eighty cents, dollar, dollar and seven is more dependable for that you should rely on. But it's just it's there's a huge difference here between your operating profit and your pre-tax income, and that's really distorting the EPS that you're getting. Let's go to our balance sheet. Um, you see there's investments here. Where's our assets? Other assets. So this must be the real estate here is all under other assets. Um, you can see they've grown at about 50%, right in line with the shares outstanding, probably because they're having to issue shares in order to um, run this business. You still have a negative retained earnings, paid in capital. Um, your long-term debt's pretty flat. Actually, that's, that's pretty good in the sense that you've grown your asset base by 50%. You've not had to increase your long-term debt, which I like seeing that cash flow statement. You can see pretty stable depreciation in the three or 400, 300 million range. Um, you've been buying PP&E. You've been buying some other, which I think is the real estate, but it's not totally clear. Um, these quick FS numbers are not very helpful here. What you can see is they diluted, they're pretty consistently diluting you though. And that's really the problem that you're having as a long-term shareholder is you're being diluted over time. Um, they're playing cash out in dividends. Pretty confusing set. Looks like they paid off um, preferred stock in the past. So that was a little hangover at the beginning of the decade. And they are issuing some debt, but not a substantial amount. I mean, I think the problem here is really you need to understand if you're going to invest in this business, this other non-operating income line from the income statement. What is going on here that would require looking at the 10K? You want to go back and look at the history of it, understand how consistently they're going to have this income, what the numbers could be, because that tells you how much you can rely on these upper numbers that you're being given. Although there's a big gap here. Um that's not showing up on quick FS that, that doesn't explain 2017. Um, for me, the problem with this business, it's not even the valuation because depending upon how that not on operating income, you, you might be able to justify a valuation here. Um, the problem is the return on invested capital. And if you have return on equity below 10%, you're going to be trapped and it's going to be very hard to get double digit returns. You have eight and a half percent return on equity that should cap your upper end of the returns if you hold on for a long time. So if you want higher returns than that, that means you can't be a long-term shareholder or you need to expect higher returns on capital in the future. Is that possible? I don't know. Um, 
But with real estate, it's a very competitive industry. So you need to be aware of that, that that could be a hamper on your overall returns for the business. And with the price to earnings ratio here, you're probably substantially overpaying at the current prices. So I'd be very, very hesitant. I mean, you think about this, you have a revenue of $1 billion and you have an $18 billion market cap. That means your price to sales at 17. Price to sales at 17 is astronomically high astronomical. You should almost never pay more than a price to sales of 10 for any business. So this is an extremely high price business. I would want to see an 80% drop in the price before it got interesting to me. I'm really thinking somewhere in the range of $8 per share would be based upon these current numbers. And so that just means that the company is just very high priced. So it's not only high priced, it's relatively low quality. So for me, I'm going to avoid Duke Realty Corporation. It's not something that's interesting for my watch list. I hope you found interest, this content helpful that you can learn more. If you did so, please hit that like button. Don't forget to subscribe. Ring the bell so you can get notified as I upload new videos each and every week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, covering new stocks. If you want to learn and to use this software yourself, check out quickfs.net. It is in the description below. First link in the description below is my affiliate link. And if you sign up using that link for a free or a paid account, then I can get a commission. It's a great way to support the channel without giving me any sort of direct compensation that I really appreciate your support. This is the tool I use to look at companies. I think you will find it very helpful. Thank you for listening. Until next time, stop paying fees, start building wealth.